he um, murdered two gang members, a father and a, a son, very brutally, uh, a couple of weeks apart. And after a manhunt, he lured two female police officers into a, an abandoned house and he um, shot them numerous times and used hand grenades and it was horrendous. So a multiple killer comes into our prison. He is the highest risk that you can get. So he's category A prisoner. Um, every time he went to court, there were armed police, snipers, everything, because he was involved with gangs in Manchester. So there was like significant risk that he could escape. He was a true psychopath, in my opinion. When I first interviewed him, he... I was kind of like, I had to sort of get all the gory details. And I was like, you know, you're in for this offence. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Don't know. Um, do, do you have any remorse for what you've done? No. I wish it hadn't been women, but so be it. In the case of Mark Bridger, I was called into the office by the big chiefs and due to the nature of his crime, potential abduction and murder, I was informed that if I didn't make it or didn't get him to court in time to face justice, that I would lose my job. Worst evidence of all, little handprints, and I mean baby girl handprints, little girl handprints on the inside of his windows. That doesn't come from a girl that's unconscious. That comes from a girl that's alive and wants to get out of that car. And when I heard that evidence, my I, it's like someone ripped out my heart. I literally, even now it makes me feel like, so I've talked about this a couple of times on podcasts, and it's the one that makes me emotional more than anything. Um, he never, ever said where the body was. Never. Such a a nice guy I, like I say when I talk about softly spoken and sweet and you can't marry that up with the level of violence that this woman sustained I mean she had to have complete reconstructive surgery on her whole face it was only later that we found out and, and later on it wasn't you know he did come back to us but we, we found out that on his chest, he had the a deformed, sort of battered face of a woman, and the prosecution used this as as sort of quite strong evidence. Another time you were lucky enough to have been assaulted as well when you were left alone with a prisoner who, who was instructed was not to be left alone with any female. Um, that was, again, I, talk, I can talk about these incidents now without any sort of like emotion attached to them. Um, I, I was on duty one day, this is at Brixton Prison, I was on duty one day as what's called a visit runner and it does what it says on the tin basically you go um <clears throat> from one place to the prison to pick up a prisoner to escort him back to visits and vice versa so the healthcare unit at Brixton so it was quite a big unit it was on like four four floors um it was predominantly psychiatric patients and it was like something flew over the cuckoo's nest across cro with silence of the lambs with something flew over the cuckoo's nest it was like a pretty grim place to be anyway in it, in hindsight maybe i take some responsibility for it because maybe i should have asked about the prisoner that was taken on my own um 
but I didn't, you know, particularly a psychiatric guy. Maybe I should have asked, but anyway, I didn't. So I went up to the fourth floor. So bearing in mind, this is like four lots of continuous steps and this there's quite a long distance. So it's one set, then another, then you get to the next floor. So in between each floor, there's two sets of stairs. So eight flights of stairs I had to go up to to pick him up. And he was there waiting and all was fine. And I made the mistake, the rookie error of walking in front of him. Now, again, in hindsight, you don't do that because you're vulnerable to being pushed down the stairs. So I obviously wasn't thinking, I wasn't switched on, I wasn't, you know, following protocol. Um, so we had a really strong African accent. So he was trying to talk to me, but I really couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, at some point, I became aware that he was telling me how beautiful I was. Again, I hate recounting stories like this because it, it, it's not that I think I am. It's just that he was a psychiatric patient. So that says it all really, doesn't it? It says uh, <laughs> his judgment was uh, severely disturbed anyway. I, I doubt the other viewers would agree with that. but Well, yeah, I'm... Uh... Yeah, I'd, like I said, if it was Tom Hardy giving the compliment, I'd take it all day long. Um, I'm obsessed with Tom Hardy, by the way. But anyway, so um, so I'm walking in front, rookie error, shouldn't do it, um, really vulnerable position to be in. He starts giving me compliments, and I can sort of understand little bits, but like I say, really thick African accent, and... Um, I get like, you're beautiful, da, 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 all the rest of it. And I kind of just ignore him because as a woman on your own with a male, it's very difficult. So there's like two kind of ways, well, there's a few ways you can deal with it. You can either ignore it. You can either make a joke about it and say, bloody hell, you know, you need some different goggles on or whatever, you know, have a bit of banter about it. Or three, you can be a complete, asshole about it and turn around and start berating them and, and giving them what for when you're a female on your own it's very difficult so you have to gauge the situation you know if you start berating someone you've got to be careful that you know you're on your own and that you're not going to get a sort of smack in the face or whatever so having the fact that I didn't understand what you're saying half the time I thought well the banter's not going to work so I'm just going to ignore it Okay, so we're walking downstairs, bearing in mind there's eight flights of stairs, bearing in mind there is no alarm bell. So on every unit that you go in a prison, there is, is like a little green box with an alarm bell. Press the alarm bell, cavalry comes running because the alarm bell will sound in a control room which tells you exactly where the incident is. So there is no alarm bell on these stairs. So I'm ignoring this guy, okay? And we walk down the stairs and I can't remember if I had my hair down I probably didn't because I think it was in the days the rules were as a woman you had to have your hair up um but I think I had it in like a ponytail and my hair was quite long at the time and uh and I became aware that he started stroking my hair well that kind of did it for me that's like that's the no-go you don't ignore that so we got to like a floor in between the landings. So I talked about the two sets of stairs. We got to the floor in between the landings. So I've got two flights of stairs above me, two flights of stairs below me that are going to get to a gate. And he starts straightening my hair and I turned around and I was like, I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing now, but I was like, that is bang out of order. Don't ever fucking touch me again. That is, you know, that is not on. You you don't do that. So already now my mind switched on to danger. So I'm thinking, shit, right, what what have I got? What what have I got safety-wise? Well, I've got no alarm bell. I've got two, two, three flights of stairs above me, two, two flights of stairs below me, and there's a gate at the bottom. So 
let me explain about getting gates through prisons. You carry a big bunch of keys, you've got to find your key. You, it's a special lot for a special key, so you've got to find each one. As you come down the stairs, even if you come down the stairs, there's like this big cumbersome gate to get through and it's a special lot, there's a special key. You have to faff around with your keys out your pocket. It's not a quick thing getting through the gate. So in my mind, there's like danger there. So I'm thinking, okay, there's this big guy, uh, significantly bigger than me. He's already touched my hair. What am I going to do? Um, I'd already berated him for touching my hair. So I'm thinking, God, where, where is this going to go? So we're stuck on a landing. And at some point he manages to get me against the wall. Um, and like I said, I'm doing very quick mental calculations. The radios were so old that you didn't have an emergency press button. The new radios have sort of like an emergency signal button that you can press. So if you can't speak or get to your radio, you know, speak on your radio, you can press and people come to your assistance. But when you're on your own, you have to remember that staff need to get through a load of those cumbersome gates. So it's not quick. And you're thinking, or I was thinking, what can happen in that short time? You know, so he's pushed me up against the wall. He started to touch me and fight or flight kicks in. And I just thought I have no chance against this guy. So I relied on my youthful fitness, bearing in mind I was like 21, 22 at the time. And I liked it. And I got through the gate at the bottom really quickly. So he was trapped, so he couldn't go anywhere because I managed to get through the gate, lock it. I was obviously really, really distraught. And um, there were staff there and they were like, what's happened? So I explained everything and they said, oh, oh, you shouldn't have been with him. I was like, why? Thanks for telling me no, like. And yeah, and they said, oh, he's on remand for two rapes. And because of his inappropriate behavior with female prison and staff, he's not allowed to be left alone with female prisoners. I was like, for fuck's sake, why did no one tell me? You know what I mean? Why the hell was I allowed to go up? So I was, I was holding it together. I was visibly shaken. At that point, they issued me with a whistle and they wish issued me with a wooden baton. That's, I mean, we use the, nowadays they use the extendable batons that the police use. At the time, they used these like old fashioned wooden bat uh, batons. So they gave me that. They gave me a whistle and apologized. And I just got on with my work. I just carried on as I did. And sort of let it go which do you design then, nicely to chemical castration well <laughs> yeah i mean he, he'd be on my list but then again there's a few stuff that would be on my list of chemical castration but um just just to sort of finish that off you know it was when i left and i think i was in my car um, or I was in a taxi and I was on the phone to my boyfriend, explained what had happened. Then I rang my mum, explained what had happened. And I think that's when it really hit me. And yeah. the sort of trauma of it. And I started sobbing my heart out, you know, really distraught. Went back to the hotel, really couldn't, because we were all staying in the hotel at the time. Um couldn't sleep, had a drink, obviously, just try and chill out, couldn't sleep, um, was terrified about going back in, even though I was given reassurances that this wouldn't happen again and stuff like that. It was still, like, in the back of my mind. But again, to take a positive out of a negative, um, it was that learning experience of checking, checking what, you know, who you're working with. And two, you know, don't leave yourself in a vulnerable position, uh, which for me was the fact that I'd gone down the stairs first. Um, so I was a bit annoyed at myself for that. 
Um, but obviously I was annoyed at the staff for, for not telling me. I mean, whether I never got to the bottom of whether they did it on purpose or whether they were just not doing their job properly. I don't know. It was it was bizarre. Um, but yeah, that was that was my experience with um, with a um, double rapist, which wasn't too good. Mm. <laughs> so you're in favour of chemical, chemical castration for sex offenders? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. If we could, we it, to be fair, if we could fully castrate them, I I would I would do that. I I think it's absolutely. I think, I mean, I've said this many times on podcasts before. I think they. That is their proclivity. That is their choice. That is their, not necessarily not, not choice, but because I think that that is just the way they are and. We ostracise them as a society for a reason, because they're dangerous. The trauma that it causes later on in life. So remember, you sort of, I'll come on to my, myself maybe a little bit, um, but the lives that it destroys, the ripple effect of the lives, you, you know, the, the lives that it, it sort of destroys, um, they're never going to be cured. Never. I um, had a conversation with a a very very prolific sex offender in Liverpool unfortunately I manage one of the sex offender wings for, for some time so I had a conversation he was a, an open paedophile he he didn't hide from the fact didn't deny the fact he was um in custody for horrific offenses rape sodomy you name it everything against um 13 year old boys and under and that was his that was his preference so we were just hanging over the landing one day hanging on the railings just chatting um like I said he was quite open about it and he said to me he said I'm assuming miss he said you can correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm being inappropriate he said I'm assuming you're straight and I said, yes, I am. And he said, and you're attracted to men. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, imagine you're being told that you must never go near a man again, must never, ever think any sexual thoughts about a man, um, you know, never engage in any sexual activity with a man. You're not to be attracted to a man in any way. And when you put it in that perspective, it they just are what they are. And he said, you feel like that about men. I feel like that about young boys. He said, so there's nothing you can do and nothing you can say that is going to change the way I am. And I thought, yeah, that I, I get it. I, I totally get it. I understand don't say it's right but I understand so for people like that they are a significant danger to society and children in general like I said the the amount of people in prison men and women that have been sexually abused that like I say the the trauma and the ripple effects are just huge mm. so yes either fully castrate them chemically castrate them or send them off to an island somewhere where they, they can have no contact with any children whatsoever. That's my thoughts. Um, it's been proven to work in America. Um, and yeah, I just think, I just think it's, it's the only way to protect children. Only I would, way. I would agree with you. The only reservation I would have, and someone said it to me and it kind of clicked in my head, that if someone was falsely accused of a crime, yeah. that that's yeah, the only and, that's the that's the only potential issue I could see with that. Like, but absolutely, and there are cases of it. Let let's let's not you know, um, children have different recollections, different you know. I know a guy that it happened to. I know a prison officer that it happened to, and it was found out to be sort of malicious you know malicious lies and yeah. 
fortunately he came back to work but he was traumatized he was a different person and and like I say he'd been falsely accused he, his kids had been taken off him and etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i'm not talking enforced castration for people like that but there are a lot of pedophiles that don't want to be pedophilic yeah, you know yeah. the, you, you know given the option they would probably accept chemical castration um obviously we can't enforce it i think in america they probably would find ways to uh, um sort of manipulate the laws so that they could um enforce it but yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and and do you know what i think those the, like the guy that i spoke to um he didn't want to be in prison if if he had an opportunity to live a life out of prison where he wasn't attracted to boys or had those urges i'm sure 100 percent he'd rather be outside of prison enjoying what what pleasures in life he could do apart from abusing children mm -hmm. it must be very difficult for you holly as well to deal with sex offenders having been a victim yourself yeah to, to... <sighs> To be honest, I, I, I put it to the back of my head, really. Um, I had like this in work, this super metal jacket, just like, um, it's like I was a different person. I realise now, sort of having left the service and having worked on myself, been in therapy and stuff like that, I realised that I masked a lot of stuff by creating a character in prison. So the character that I created, still still me, still, you know, still the me that you see now, but was a lot more sort of brazen. And, you know, I was drinking a lot during the prison service. You know, I had um, an addiction to painkillers. I'd do anything I could do to sort of get through the day. Um, I thought I did a good job. I thought I was empathic to everyone that I met compassionate even to the sex offenders because I wasn't ready to accept what happened to me I was I didn't tell anyone until I was probably 30 um like in my job we've had to deal with sex offenders as well on occasion and it can be quite challenging but as yeah, I said yeah. you, ha you have to be a professional and objective and just exactly you know, treat them the same as you would as you would anyone it else Exactly. And even if it's false empathy, even if I don't like the person, I can still show them empathy. I can say it sounds awful that like you're acting, but at the end of the day, you don't want to lose someone. You don't want to lose a life. You don't want to deal, deal with that. You don't want that for the families. The families of sex offenders are victims as well. Let's not forget that, you know, they're the ones that are going to also be ostracised by communities and things like that. Um, so, yeah, you do, yeah. you can. But, yeah, I would say sort of the, the sort of impact of what happened to me has only really sort of come to the forefront in the, the last four years, I would yeah. say. So, yeah, at the time just didn't, I didn't acknowledge it but I like I say I was drinking I was masking I was doing whatever I needed to do to get through the day get through the stress speaking of people drinking there was a there was an occasion where a couple of lads had a bit of a hoolie in the in the cell with, with some hooch or spice a hoolie what's it what the fuck is a hoolie <laughs> a hoolie would be an Irish term for a bit of a party a wild party right the hooch, the hooch went a bit wrong. Oh my god, yeah. So if you think of like, so we'd been in the cell earlier and we'd smelt cannabis and we couldn't find the cannabis, but we could smell it. And I was kind of like, I was in charge of the prison that day. I was like highest uniform rank, so I was principal officer, and I I had a governor above me. But it meant that anything sort of riot operational wise i had to deal with so these guys we've been in the cell previously because we'd cannabis so i thought you know what we can't find it but if i had to choose any drug for a prisoner to be on cannabis would be it okay they just, yeah they just chilled out and they just want to eat and 
it's not i'm not saying it's great i mean i'm i'm a firm believer now and i can say this now leaving the prison service i'm a firm believer that it should be decriminalized um, completely um mm. and or, or or even to the point of legalized i know people that use it for back pain and all, all the other sorts of anxiety so but at the time obviously in the prison service you've you've got to follow the rules anyway Cutting another long story short, because I, I'm fucking brilliant at these long stories, aren't I? So, <laughs> okay, so it turns out that these five guys in this one cell, so that's how many were living in this cell. So it was a big cell. So it had like two sections to it. So it turns out that they later on had a hoolie, as you would say, because they'd been brewing their own alcohol. So in prison they brew their own alcohol fuck knows how i think they use fermented fruit and sugar and i don't know where the hell they get alcohol from but anyway so they brew this disgusting hooch that is probably like 100 percent proof and just sends... did you ever hear of pochine no it's like it's light at 90 percent and close to 100 percent alcohol it's made from potatoes it's like an irish <laughs> drink like it's a le- it's a legal drink like pochine that we kind of you so i imagine it was something similar like yeah oh i didn't oh i bet yeah i bet so because we used to do fruit runs you see we used to check all the cells for fruit but we never used to check for potatoes so <laughs> who knows um but yeah so they all decided to get pissed on this disgusting fucking whatever they were drinking um and they got a bit rowdy and they got a bit rowdier and it was setting all the other prisoners off and we knew we had to deal with them, which is fine. We thought, okay, they're a bit pissed. They're not causing any harm. We'll just deal with them. Next thing, they've smashed the cell up. They've flooded. There's water coming out underneath the door. They've put barricade up. They're, they're really, so it's getting violent now and we have to deal with them. So we've got, and it's, it's the, the most annoying thing was it was at the end of the shift end of an evening shift where all the staff are fucked off and tired all they want to do is go home and i'm asking for volunteers to stay on so i'm sort of like say uniform rank highest uniform rank so it's my job to get people so we've got five prisoners okay so you need three staff minimum for each prisoner that's 15 staff you then need some backup staff. So that's another five. So you need 20 staff. Then you need supervisors for each one. So you're talking probably another 20. So 25, 30 staff in total, maybe, like which is literally probably the, the total of, of the staff that we've got on duty. So I'm asking for volunteers. And you can, as you can imagine, people are not forthcoming about going into a cell filled with water and cannabis smoke and or overtime as well if it's exactly <laughs> well they didn't get overtime they all they got was the time back so they didn't get paid for it um so i knew things were serious when um a friend of mine went to um look through the cell flat to see what we were dealing with and next thing a broom pole smashed through the glass observation panel and it was like something out of the matrix you know when they like flip back like that and it's like this this pole was like heading towards his eye and he managed to do this crazy matrix flip i'm like right they're really gonna hurt someone now so we have to do it so basically i said staff i said no one's going home i'll shut that i'll lock the gates so i had the authority to prevent people from leaving the prison so I said, right, I'll lock down the gates. No one can leave. We've got to deal with this. So eventually <clears throat> I got all my staff together. And like I say, the cell was flooded. So it's wet. So it's not a nice place. And bearing in mind, you've got to wrestle these people to the floor first. So staff knew they were going to get piss wet through. There's probably smashed glass in there. It's not going to be pleasant. Um, but we send the staff in anyway. So the staff enter the cell. So you've got 15 staff five prisoners to 20 people fighting in a cell and i mean fighting in a cell so normally i would stay out of the cell because i'm sort of in charge of the whole instant and i you know i want to see what's going on but they're in there for ages and i'm like 
wait a second, this this isn't right. People, they're not getting a grip here. Not no disrespect to the staff, but they it, they're not getting a grip because something's going wrong. So I went into the cell, and I, I can't describe what it was like. I mean, I've never I've never been to like a football match and seen like hooligans kick off or whatever. I can only liken it to like yes. a, hooligan, a hooligan kick off. Do you know what I mean? They were just maybe that field in May, like. Yeah. <laughs> Do no. not say that. No, oh, no, my, no. I, oh, you're playing, the, the match you're going to is kind of the match you're going to Brentford, and they wouldn't be in any way renowned for that. So that was just me joking. Better be, it. otherwise I'm, I'm sending my ex-husband. Um, <laughs> I'm sure some Brentwood fans would love to kick his head in. But anyway, um, so I went into this cell. So it's piss wet through, and I'm just like Jesus Christ. I said it was utter chaos so there's water all over the floor there's 20 people in this cell that is designed for five people 20 people Mm. there's broken chair legs there's broken tables there's broken beds it's fucking chaos and at one point like i'm trying to grab hold of people i'm trying to get rid of weapons i'm trying to throw stuff out the room i'm trying to ask more staff to come in but then there was no room for any staff um, and I'm in charge of it, and I'm thinking, how the hell are we going to deal with this? Fortunately, Liverpool staff, brilliant, they're top marks. I have to say, and I hope like none of my other colleagues hear this, but Liverpool and Manchester staff, the best staff in the prison service. Um so they managed to wrestle them out and we made the decision to, um, so there's two big wings and there's an exercise yard so we could walk to the segregation unit. Decision was made to walk them all to the segregation unit. So we thought we're going to make an example of these fuckers here. So we, we are going to walk them so that everyone knows that we've dealt with them. We're going to walk them through the exercise yard. And um, one of them tried to, I was walking down with one of them and one of them tried to kick out. And so quite rightly, I used my approved techniques and I flattened him on the floor with the staff taking hold of him and (laughs) his face hit the dirt. And um, I had a cacophony of shouts of go on, Miss D and doors being kicked and prisoners seeing what I'd done because I was well known for getting involved. Fighting with men doesn't bother me. I'll I'll take Kenny it scored like say again a goal for Kenny <laughs> yeah um I would take anyone it just doesn't bother me I would I don't know what it is that you sort of go into this different phase of like mm. whether it's adrenaline or whatever I don't know but anyway so yeah we flattened this guy he got a bit of grit on his face to be fair luckily he's no broken nose but um. Yeah, we showed them what for in the end, but it was <laughs> utter, utter chaos. Speaking of guys getting a bit rowdy in cells, um, the story of Danny G has kind of become a YouTube sensation, mm. especially over the last couple of years. Were you in strange ways at the time when Danny G was in Yeah, prison? I was. And <sighs> Danny's got a bit of a reputation. So, obviously, <laughs> all the G brothers have a bit of a reputation. Um, I know Darren G is sort of quite prevalent on YouTube now. Um, so I used to work, going back years now, so I used to work with a girl at Style. And I say girl, she was about 16, 17. And she was a fucking nightmare. She, she would fight staff. At, she was tiny, but she would fight staff at every opportunity. And she came in, she was one of the revolving doors, and she came in and she had been like really badly beaten up and we were like crikey what happened to you and we found out that she worked for Danny G um, as a sex worker and she tells us he was a pimp and he'd absolutely battered her and she was black and blue and she's tiny she's tiny smaller than me she was like nothing she's a heroin addict she was just skin and bones and she was tiny and he absolutely battered her so obviously I had a really dark opinion of him um he'd done the rounds throughout the high security estate he was renowned for decimating cells 
you know, like taking them, just taking them apart. He was renowned for getting out of cells. He was every cell they put him in, he would decimate. Um, so I was, I'm always in charge of the, I'm always in charge of the difficult units. I don't know why that was. They always put me in charge of segregation units. Um, but I was sort of over the segregation unit at the time and Danny G was brought in. And I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake, I haven't got the room for people. I haven't got the space to be putting, putting him in different cells. You know what I mean? He's, But he came there. I think previously I talked about accumulated visits. So he wasn't there for behavioural reasons. He was there because he, um, local to, to Liverpool, Manchester, he was there to um, have his accumulated visits. So he was going to be on his best behaviour physically so he wasn't going to attack staff but that doesn't mean that he wasn't going to complain and cause problems and cause issues and incite others so I met him and I won't liken him to Purple Aki because he wasn't like Purple Aki uh, but we had a good relationship we got on quite well I mean you probably wouldn't remember me now but um, as I dealt with other prisoners you know it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done. If you give me a problem, you'll get a problem back. But as it was, he didn't give me any problems. And, you know, he always used to ask for me, always. So if he had any problems, he wouldn't ask the staff, he'd ask for me. And I think because, not blowing smoke up my ass, but it's just one rule that I always used to stick to, always stick to in the prison service. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you can't do it, come back yeah. and give an explanation or give a time frame or do something to show that you're actioning what you say, you know, you're going to do. And quite often staff will be asked to request by prisoners, but they don't have the authority really that governors have. Um, so, for example, I could ring up somewhere and say, I want this done now and it'd be done now. Remember, staff could ring up and it would take three weeks. So that's why they tend to go to go to governors um and yeah he used to miss d that's my other name as long as as well as kenny miss d or queen that at liverpool they used to call me queen queen um, kenny. yeah and uh so yeah he always used to ask for for miss d and i used to get his list of requests and his list of complaints and can I do this and can I do that and can I do the other so he was quite demanding but in terms of his behavior and I said to him you know you, you I will sort out what I can for you but the minute you start fucking around the minute you destroy my cells you minute you know you get nothing that's it and I think because he was on accumulated visits he was on his you know good behavior um so didn't want to lose that privilege um but Sal liked him as difficult because I knew his history. I knew what he'd done to this girl. Um, really Did difficult. that actually surprise, not surprise me, but I didn't think they were involved in in, in that, being pimps and stuff. So that's the shocking Well, too. I mean, this is going back a long, long time. You know, this is going back 20 odd years, if not more. Um, she could have been lying. You know, who knows? But she, they were from the same place and... We knew she was a young sex worker, so did, who knows? But he didn't have a very good reputation anyway um, due to his violence. And people were, you know, people were scared of him. But like I say, all I can say is, I mean, sometimes he used to get a little bit naughty. But I think as a woman, they were slightly more respectful and slightly more believing in the fact that we would do what we said we would do because quite often you'd go down to the segregation unit because the governor had to go down every day and check the welfare of all the prisoners and you'd speak to them and they'd say oh I spoke to governor such and such last week about this and it's still not been done and so I'd ring governor such and such and say have you done this for prisoner x and they'd say oh no I forgot I mean, these are the sort of things that yeah. cause problems, these cause issues. They have to be in touch and, and funnily enough, when I was sectioned, I was on the other side 
of the door and I was on the other side of the experience. So I've got now sort of greater understanding of what they were going through and things that may seem very minor to you or me become massive, massive issues to these guys. Huge. Um, did, did you come across yeah. Darren at all when you were in prison? No, I think, he was, I think he was in at the same time that I was there, but I didn't. I didn't interact with him. He was there. That You always knew when the Gs were there. Um, but no, I, I didn't interact with him. I've, I've seen quite a lot of his YouTube videos and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I just I watch with interest. Yeah, he's a um, bit of a character. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a couple of famous prisoners, I suppose, which may not, which we wouldn't maybe know too much about in Ireland. Another famous prisoner you had was Dale Cregan, who was a yeah. you know, top killer. Always like dealing with him. Um, unsettling. Um, I had a lot to do with him. Um, he had one eye, so he had a black onyx eye. Um, I, I mean, is he well known in Ireland? Was it, did the news sort of make it there? I can't really remember, but I've I've heard him on so many channels on YouTube that um, I kind of know his story now. But I, I wouldn't say he'd be massively known over here. Yeah. I mean, so just just for some sort of background, he um, murdered two gang members, a father and a, a son, very brutally, uh, a couple of weeks apart. And after a manhunt, he lured two female police officers into um, into a, a an abandoned house, and he um, shot them numerous times and used hand grenades and it was horrendous so a multiple killer comes into our prison he is the highest risk that you can get so he's category a prisoner um every time he went to court there were armed police snipers everything because he was involved with gangs in manchester so there was like significant risk that he could escape we didn't know if there was a risk to him from other people or whether it was a risk to himself. And it was my job to manage that risk. Um, he was a true psychopath, in my opinion. I think this, there was some discussion. He did go to the psychiatric hospital for an evaluation. And they did pump him full of antipsychotics, which I believe did absolutely nothing because he wasn't psychotic. Because there was some talk that he was going through a psychotic phase at the time of the offences. However, I would disagree with this to the point that he murdered the two female police officers, then went and handed himself in and said to the police, you harassed my family, now I've done yours. So basically it was a revenge tactic because he'd been on the run. So the police had been sort of after the first double murder, the police had been looking for him. So I interviewed him on numerous occasions. Um, eventually they sent him to Ashworth Hospital, which is a high security psychiatric hospital. Um, he came back a different man. He Prior to going, he'd been muscular, gym head, steroids, you know, ripped, um, obviously looked after himself and he came back a bit of a fat blob of a zombie, obviously full of psychiatric drugs that that's what they do to you, particularly antipsychotics. Um, so yeah, very, very strange dealing with him. He, when I first interviewed him, he, I was kind of like, I had to sort of get all the gory details and I was like, you know, you're in for this offence. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Don't know. Um, do, do you have any remorse for what you've done? No. I wish it hadn't been women, but so be it. Um, have you got any worries? Yeah. Um, my son and my girlfriend, they were actually taken into to police protection because there was a threat against them. But I believe he was only saying that because that's what, because that's what psychopaths do. They sort of, watch other people in emotional situations to see how they should respond and watch what they should say mm -hmm. and I think he almost said that like he didn't really give a shit about his son 
and his girlfriend, but he was expected to say that he gave a shit. Um, as for everything else, he was so blasé, so unconcerned, didn't give a shit about anyone, was just, like I say, for what he'd done and the, the horrendous nature. I mean, he not only shot these people, I mean, like I say, he shot a, a, um, a son, then a father, but he'd used grenades as well. Um, and he'd always had a fascination with guns and stuff like that. But, you know, grenades cause serious damage to someone to someone's body. Um, so he was no he was a player. You know, he was he was up there. Um, but just pure psychopath. Was that the prisoner who you were warned by the governor that if he committed suicide, you'd be out of a job? Yes, there was two of them, him and one other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Bridger, I'm just about to come to, so we may as well may as well combine the two of them together there. Yeah. Mark Bridger was another high profile prisoner. Yeah, now this is this is probably I mean, I've talked about traumatic stuff in the prison and I can sort of laugh a lot of stuff, like with my gallows humour. This one I'll never shake out of my mind and there is not one part of it that I really can laugh at other than, you know, the incredulity of his behaviour and what went on. So again, just a synopsis of his crime, little girl called April went missing, um, from a housing estate in McConcliffe in Wales. She was five years old. She had cerebral palsy and she was on a pink bike. She was seen getting in. There was a child witness who saw her getting into a car and the uh, it was considered an abduction. And they found her pink bike and there was a witness saying she got into this car. So... Um, Long story short, that's my favourite saying today. Long story short, it really short. stuck to it as well. In fairness, you like you really practiced it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was eventually found. Well, he was eventually there was there was lots of little bits of evidence that uh, was enough to to send him to prison on remand. And again, so I was in charge of sort of his care, if you put it like that because he was considered a risk of suicide. Um, He was definitely at risk from other prisoners due to the crime that he committed. Her body had not been found, um, but there was the strong suspicion that he had abducted and murdered her, and there was evidence to to point to that. So you can imagine, not popular with other prisoners, and um, probably looking at a life sentence, so, uh, you know, at risk of suicide. And... um, yeah, so I was pulled into the office by the, the great chiefs and said that he has to get to court. He has to face justice. So it was different because with Dale Cregan, I didn't have any sort of feelings of, am I bothered about his family? Am I bothered about the consequences? They're all into the gang sort of culture, the drug culture, et cetera, et cetera. April's family were devastated and had been all over the news and they were devastated and I felt a real and no one will ever know this no one ever ever will know this this is the first time I've probably said this I felt such a weight of responsibility to that family they'll they'll never know me They'll never know me. They'll never know sort of the, the work I did. And I don't want them to. I'm not I'm not bothered. I just know that personally I felt the weight of responsibility of keeping this man alive. And if I could, this was sort of my own little nugget, if I could get any indication of where her body was from what it was telling us. So as you can imagine, I spent a lot of time with him. As a governor, 
the reason sort of governors took over the care of these people was because they were so high profile if the shit hit the fan it was my name on the paperwork yeah so in the case of mark bridger i was called into the office by the big chiefs and due to the nature of his crime potential abduction and murder i was informed that if i didn't make it or didn't get him to court in time to face justice that i would lose my job so as you can imagine i spent a great deal of time with this man obviously because of the sort of um nature of the offense and the fact that they needed a high level of authority to to put the name onto the paperwork so I saw this man probably every day for eight or nine months and I had a team working around me in between as we managed his care and when he first came into prison this is really interesting I know the dynamics of psychopathy are fascinating to me um and when he first came into prison and I should have been aware um, you know, I was a psychology student. I've worked in mental health for years. I've dealt with psychopaths for years. I, I, I should know. I should spot them a mile off. And he came into prison, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say this. He was good looking. He was charming. He was articulate. He was most importantly believable, and that's the scary thing. He was believable, and and when you go back to look at sort of his life in the community i think he'd had a couple of domestic violence sort of bits on his record but in terms of violence towards children or or sexual proclivity of children nothing no evidence community just thought it was a bit of a loner you know no issues so he comes into prison and he's charming articulate all the rest of it and denies the offense and he's so charming and so believable that I would say for the first seven days, bearing in mind I saw him every single day, along with mental health nurses, psychiatrists, prison officers, you name it. And between us all, we were kind of like, this man might not be guilty. You know, we started to think maybe he hasn't done it. There is no real evidence. There is no body. There is no, you know, evidence that we're aware of. So he could be innocent. That was seven days. Seven days we thought that. And he used to cry. We'd interview him. We'd sit in this room. He used to cry. And it's only now that I realised that he did an amber heard and not one tear would drop out of his eye. He'd screw his face up. It'd be all red. He'd be blown his nose, be tissues, but actually he wasn't crying. And the belief in him soon wore off. But I do remember several conversations coming out of meetings saying, has he done it? Is he really a psychopath? He can't be a psychopath. He's so nice. What a nice guy. You know, if you met him in a bar, you'd let him buy you a drink, you know. And, but as the days went on and his first story came out, which he stuck to for so long, and I think he still st sticks to it now, that he was drunk and he was driving his vehicle and he hit April on her bike. And uh, because he was pissed, he didn't, you know, thought the worst would happen. So he thought the best idea in his drunken haze would be to put April's body in the car and then go and dispose of it. And he has no idea. He vaguely remembers setting a fire somewhere, but he was so black out that he doesn't remember where he put her. Horrendous. So we started to hear the bits of evidence that there was no evidence on his car at all that he'd hit a pink bike. Worst evidence of all, little handprints. And I mean, baby girl handprints, little girl handprints on the inside of his windows. That doesn't come from a girl that's unconscious. That comes from a girl that's alive and wants to get out of that car. And when I heard that evidence, my I, it's like someone ripped out my heart. I literally, even now it makes me feel like, so I've talked about this a couple of times on podcasts and it's the one that makes me emotional 
more than anything. Um, he never, ever said where the body was. Never. He got found guilty. Um, there was evidence that we found out prior to the Prior to the court case, um, so example is we we knew in advance that they had found bone fragments in his fire, but they were not enough to distinguish DNA. So all they could say is that they were human in origin. And I, this, I'm going to try not cry here. <laughs> you make it, it. You're making me emotional. This needs to stop. Um, The family took those little fragments because that's all they had and they buried that. But they didn't have a body ever to bury. Like and, he, was like, he was like a crawling sap as well with the sounds of it. Like he was kind of, I'd love to help. Or yes, to yes. He would, he would say, so he would, in the mornings we'd unlock and he'd go, oh. April's come to me in a dream and she's trying to tell me where she is or he'd be in his cell drawing maps and things like that. And when we'd realised that he was absolutely full of shit and he was just a complete and utter psychopath, it, it, we were just so angry. And I mean, so, so angry. But your professional head comes on and you think justice for the family and I don't care I don't care if I need to molly coddle that guy and say oh there there I feel so sorry for you you must be having a really tough time da, 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 da. don't give a fuck if I have to do that if I have to pretend to get him to court then that's what I need to do the only thing that guts me and sticks with me is that they never found a body and one of the one of the things that really got to me is if you are a psychologist, mental health nurse, whatever, if you work in that field, you get um, something called supervision, which is basically if you've got something that you've dealt with that's traumatic, you can pass that on to someone else who can sort of give you guidance or just give you some support or reassurance, whatever. And that sort of supervision goes up the chain. So everyone's always got someone to talk to at a higher level. And not one person in senior management ever asked me if I was there because it was just my job it's just your job yeah. that's all it is it's just your job and I'm again not ashamed to admit it I went I worked in an office with some amazing staff and we cried many many times um but particularly the day he went to court and got sentenced and never came back was really hard because it was almost like no closure mm -hmm. yes he's been sentenced brilliant yes he's been given a life sentence brilliant no body no closure no closure for the family your heart breaks for the family you're we're broken we're distressed we're disturbed we've had to deal with that fucking psychopath for nine months lying to us crying faking we've had to pretend to care for nine months and not one person did we didn't get a debrief we got nothing like i said nothing compared to what the family went through nothing at all but our heart broke under the threat together. under the threat and stress of potentially losing your job if something went wrong as well so that must have been yeah i mean to be honest with you that didn't even cross my mind. That that wasn't because I was so emotionally involved. It, it didn't cross my mind. So my, my needs, my sort of everything went out the window. I forgot about me because it was about him, you know. So the thought of losing my job didn't even cross my mind. I was kind of so absorbed in the case and what was going on and and stuff like that. Um but it's the one thing that <clears throat> almost almost broke me. Um speaking yeah. of charming prisoners, there was a guy there was a guy who came across quite plausible as well. But he had a tattoo of a woman being pulverized and he actually acted out the fantasy 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was at Liverpool Prison. I had... So I'm not going to say where I lived, but um, I lived in a place, quite a small town, um, that had a couple of clubs and it was um, quite lively on a Friday and Saturday night. And... um, Everyone knew each other, et cetera, et cetera. And it had been in the news that a woman had been um, raped at the back of like a supermarket and she'd had a face pulverized. Okay. And when I say pulverized, I mean like every bone in her face broken while she was being raped. So she was beaten and raped horrifically. Um <clears throat> Obviously, it was in the local news, so we were all like, shit, you know, we go drinking there. We, you know, we we could have seen him, We, you know, anything like that. The reason the rape stopped is it had been caught on CCTV and um, I think a security guard or something raised a barrier and that's kind of what alerted the guy thinking someone was coming, so he ran off. So I didn't know who this guy was i didn't read the news in terms of finding out his name or anything else i just heard heard about this rape um so he came into prison and i didn't know who he was and i think he was uh, deemed at risk of suicide or self-harm uh and he was a new prisoner on my wing and he was in for rape so he was put on the sex offender wing and um i spent i interviewed him um I think for his suicide self-harm form. So I think I did quite a lengthy interview with him. And um, it wasn't until later on. So we just chit-chat him, chit-chit-chit-chat. And he's only young. Well, I was young as well. I say I was about, I was like 27. I think he was like 22, 23 or something. Again, not ashamed to admit it. Good looking guy. Obviously went to the gym really well well toned well turned out looked after himself softly spoken intelligent um really interesting to listen to um and we didn't touch on his offense we hadn't touched on his offense and i just found myself absorbed with him i was almost like mesmerized and i wouldn't say that in terms of i was attracted to him because i wasn't because that you know it's there's like a definite line that like your invincibility cloak there's like a a sort of non-attraction thing that goes on with but i was so mesmerized that this young lovely guy was in prison i'm like what the fuck and i'm thinking and he's on my wing there must be something wrong that there must be something wrong So we carry on this conversation. It's probably taking way too long than it should do because, like I say, I'm quite into the conversation and keen to listen to what he's got to say. And next thing, we come to his offence and he tells me that he is in for or he's been accused of um, battery or in fact uh, section 18 they might call it which is sort of like one under attempted murder section 18 and rape I was like oh okay and then he said where it was and I instantly knew who he was then and I instantly knew he was that rapist from my town and I was instantly terrified because I could have met him in a bar quite easily again he could have bought me a drink and i would probably I'm not saying i would have gone off with him that makes it sound like a right little tart doesn't it but you know what i mean it, it it wouldn't have been difficult to be sucked in by him let's put it let's put it like that yeah um so i'm still kind of in the mindset of mm, this is you know he's a nice guy it can't be him it can't be you know such a nice guy i like say when i talk about softly spoken and sweet and you can't marry that up 
with the level of violence that this woman sustained. I mean, she had to have complete reconstructive surgery on her whole face. It was only later that we found out, and, and later on, it wasn't, you know, he did come back to us, but we, we found out that on his chest, he had the a deformed sort of battered face of a woman. And the prosecution used this as as sort of quite strong evidence. And then I don't know what other evidence there was, but there was something found either in his house or something like this that sort of indicated that he was into sort of violence towards women, but extreme violence, not just a little slap or a smack on the arse or whatever, you know, this, this full, but he had a tattoo of a disfigured woman. And that's what they think he was trying to recreate. Like a uh, of, yeah. Yeah, again, so completely. I mean, I've said this, <clears throat> excuse me, I've said this many, many times about prisoners. It's so difficult to marry up the offence with the behaviour because you meet them and you just think, yeah, I'll go for a pint with you. I'd let you buy me a glass of wine. That simple. You progressed very well in the prison service. In yeah. Lovener, and you weren't a Freemason. No. <laughs> However, other people can't really say the same in the prison service. Do you want to maybe just... Yeah, I mean, it was, I would say, sort of at its peak in the 80s till the 2000s, the sort of Masonic grip on the prison service. And it wasn't just the prison service. It was, you know, any sort of the, the court system, um, the police, um, anything like that, any sort of institution a uh, big institution like that and it had infiltrated the prison service it had caused numerous problems um it was it was like a, a dirty secret in the prison service so no one would outwardly say they were a mason but people knew who was a mason if that makes sense and there were lots of different lodges um but we used to have a guy that was in charge of the whole sort of area and he was known to be a mason. And it was just like, you knew people had been put in jobs, not due to their competency, but purely due to who they knew in their Masonic Lodge. And, and the right handshake. Exactly. Right handshake, yeah. And like I said, they all pissed in the same pot. We all knew about it. I mean, the good thing for me is that I was out of that loop because I was a woman. So if I did get promoted, I can say, hand on heart, I was promoted through competence. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. we, were, we were working in a time where, you know, women weren't really massively getting promoted. Uh, it's a lot different now, like. Um, but yeah, it was like, there was one guy that I know of that took on the system, shall we say, and he um, he challenged the decision, took a, a grievance out uh, because he'd been denied promotion and someone else who was believed to be a Mason was, was put in that position. Um, and it went all the way to the top, 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 top. And funnily enough, it was all covered up and this guy was given a promotion. The other guy that was the Mason, he still kept his promotion. They just gave this guy a promotion just to shut him up. These things were kept very, very secret, these investigations. Um, it eventually came in as a condition of service that you had to declare if you were a member of any certain groups, one of them being like the National Front. Don't know who would, you know... Um, admit to that um combat 18 was one and i think uh, and the the masons was the other so you had to but then that was just kept secret and tucked away in an hr folder so what the fuck do you know what i mean there was some corruption as well for masons to get the higher pension rate that you get promoted a number of times yeah so so i mean 
it was quite it was quite common anyway but you know one of the sort of uh, our pensions of, uh, in the prison service of, as before they changed them changed them to the new pension scheme uh, were always called golden handshake pensions um so we never used to speak to our pensions we were literally like I say given lump sum golden handshake off you go um it's calculated differently now however so you used to finish your pension you used to finish on your pension based on the current salary you were working okay so i'll give it in terms of numbers so if you were and this isn't correct i'm just just generalizing here so if you were a band eight on fifty thousand pounds you that's the golden handshake you would finish on whatever amount that would be 150,000 or whatever so what would happen is that people who would be like band five on maybe 30 grand a year miraculously six months before retirement would be made promoted three times and back on 50 grand a year or back uh, you know or on 50 grand a year so you can see it was all done yeah. like inverted commas legitimately but, but it was blatant like oh okay they're sat in an office doing fuck all on 60 grand or whatever and they've got the golden handshake and do you know what though if someone said to me it's really difficult that's a really difficult question if someone said to me oh you can retire on 30 grand or you can retire on 60 grand what are you going to say do you know what yeah <laughs> That's it's true. really it's a really difficult thing to sort of you know argue against but yeah it's been frustrating though when you walk your way up without that help or contacts like and... um i would say do you know what i think throughout my service i worked my ass off i had a good relationship with staff good relationship with prisoners i'm fortunate that i was sorry my glasses keep slipping down i was fortunate that i believe i had a good reputation um i'm pretty certain i had a good reputation for being a hard worker and for being conscientious and for being positive um and i'm lucky that there are managers that when i've gone for jobs already know about me or have heard about me or you know so that helps and when I've needed something on a compassionate basis, I've always been helped out. However, that's not because I can do a funny handshake. That's because I've worked my ass off, worked my way up from the bottom and, you know, have proved myself. So in some ways, whatever help I have had, I think I deserve. But I've never been promoted over other people. I've never been given anything at someone else's detriment. Let's put it like that. I remember you were saying you'd be having banter with the actual Mason saying your lodge looked after you again. <laughs> and they'd be like, the one guy would be like rolling his eyes going, what the fuck's not this again? And we'd be <laughs> like, are you at the lodge this weekend? And they'd be like, oh, shut up, shut up. And yeah, it was, uh, we'd have a bit of a giggle about it. There's a, bad, a lot of better sauce in prison, like hot water and sugar and that type of stuff that you probably wouldn't mm -hmm. come across. One of the things you said before, you'd have slashings with razor blades and two two brushes. Yeah, um, because it didn't. The gap was so narrow, you couldn't. Yeah, stitch you it. can't you can't stitch it together. But there's one guy that got a slashing that you had to act as a nurse for, which is a, a good story. Yeah, and and again, like I've I've recounted this story before, and and people are like, "Oh, you're taking the piss out of someone that's been slashed," and I'm like, "Wait a second. This guy was slashed for a reason. One, he's in prison. And two, he had either stolen from someone or he'd grasped or he'd done something. So whatever he'd done in the eyes of the prison, the prison population, he deserved it. However, I didn't leave him. As 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 a just a normal member of staff, I could have said, no, I'm not touching this. He can lose his face and his head, whatever. I'm not bothered. Um, so... It was in the evening. It's always in the evening. Always when we've got no staff. Do you know what I mean? It's like, home, why, yeah. why can't you do it in the day? 
when when people are you know when we've got lots of people uh, so i was duty governor that night so if someone's going out to hospital or out for any reason you need to sign a sort of release form for them to go so i was called to um reception um i knew an incident had gone on i hadn't gone to the incident but i knew an incident had gone on and they said this guy's in reception we're just waiting for a nurse to come we don't know whether to call an ambulance or or whatever will you come down i said yeah sure so i got down and this poor guy is like face is hanging off and I, and i think he had a slap i think he had a slash to his head no i think it was was it his head that i said can't remember anyway whatever there was skin falling off and there was lots of blood, which I don't do well with. But I do better with blood than I do with people. Anyway, so all the staff, like none of the staff would touch him. And I'm like, where's the nurse? Oh, she's doing medications. So the one thing in the prison, as a prison nurse, you probably spend most of your time doing medications. That's all you do. Okay. So. No nurse is turning up. This guy's bleeding. He's not bleeding to death, but he's bleeding heavily. And I'm thinking, mm, this bit of skin, this flap of skin, I, I'm pretty sure needs to sit back where it where it was. Um, and I said to the staff, is anyone first aid trained? And everyone like looks to the ground. I was like, for fuck's sake. Right, I'll do it. Because at Style, when they used to self-harm all the time, the nurse couldn't respond to all of these. So we used to patch them up ourselves. You know, we were used to patching up people that had self-harmed or had been injured. So this guy comes and I said, right, I'm going to have to do it. And he's like, you're not a nurse. And I said, it's completely up to you. I'm training in first aid. It's up to you. I can either put the bandages on or you can leave that flap of skin, leave it bleeding and see what happens. And he was like, well, OK, then like really surly and moody. So I wasn't taken by him anyway. I didn't really like him anyway. So I got the bandages out put my gloves on and I really didn't know what the fuck I was doing to be fair so I, I like put this flap of skin where it should be and I just started bandaging him and then I didn't realize that this is one of those so it was one of those ones that's got like a cotton bit that you put on the wound and then it's got like the wrappy bit around the top but unbeknownst to me it, it must have been the world's longest bandage. It must have been like 20 metres long. And this blood kept seeping through. And I'm wrapping this bandage and it's just going round and round and round and round. And he looked like, by the time I finished with him, he had this crown of a bandage on. All I, And I think I'd done his face as well. I think I'd gone round his chin like that. I'd like done naughty. his forehead. <laughs> done his forehead and then he had this big crown and he was going mental he was like i look like a right fucking knob how can you send me and i said right i'll undo it it's absolutely fine no skin off my nose but it is skin off your face so let's go for it and he was like no no i don't want it i don't i don't want it undoing i said well you either go out looking like a knob i know you look like a knob you know you look like a knob i'm really sorry that my bandaging skills are not up to par but you're just going to have to go or you're going to lose your face in your head. Up to you. Have you seen Noddy, the Ina Blyton character? Yeah. Did, did he look a bit like that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Bless him. But he he was more like he looked like a knob and he said, I look like a fucking twat. I was like, oh, bless you. Get out. Didn't like him anyway. <laughs> but I saved it. I saved his, not saved his bacon, but, you know, Gave him the emergency first aid that he needed. Anyway, he came back. I was still in reception. He only went out and got stitched and came back. And he was still having a go at me. I'm like, are you fucking serious? That you, You've been sorted out. You've been stitched up. Had, it not, had you had to wait for a nurse, you would have bled more. Less likely you would have... Because when you have a slashing or something like that, you've got to stitch within six hours. Six hours is the the, the sort of time limit um, because anything over, and I believe you can get infections. So it's really important that you get someone out quickly when they've had sort of like a slashing or something. And the way the nurses work, not their fault, but they have 3,000 medications to deliver. It, they could have taken two hours to get down to reception. So I personally think I did a really good job. But yeah, he was calling me every name under the sun and, and 
basically calling me a witch and things like that. And I'd made him look a twat and he had to look, he had to walk into hospital looking like that. And I'm like, I really don't give a shit. But, you know. You know, there was a guy um, in the cell that used to, to roll up his shit like Maltesers and oh. put shit in his head. Yeah. What was his so, story? <laughs> so it's not uncommon for foreign national prisoners to end up in custody. So um, illegal immigrants quite often commit crime to um, whatever because they can't fund their lifestyle or whatever and they come into custody. And when they come into custody, if they've been sentenced or whatever, um, they're likely to be deported. Now, if you're from Iran or Syria or somewhere like that, the Democratic Republic of Congo or whatever, where is bloody, you know, um, genocides and things like that, you're not going to want to go home, are you? You're going to want to no. stay. Even, even a fucking prison cell in Walton's better than, like, a life in Iran. Anyway, so we had the skis come in, and quite often they come in, and because they either don't speak English at all or don't pretend or pretend that they can't speak English. You literally have no information. You can have five or six different birthdays for them. You can have five or six different names for them. You don't know anything. No one knows other than what he's told people. So it could be utter bullshit. Anyway, they've quickly cottoned on, and there's quite a few that did this, quickly cottoned on that if you pretend to be mad, you can go to a hospital. Now, a hospital is a really nice place to go because it's not like a prison. You get a lot more privileges, nicer environment, get looked after, blah, 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 blah. And also, if you're mad enough, your stay in hospital will be longer than your stay in prison and you might not even get deported. So there's, there's, there's all these benefits and bonuses to being mad if you're a foreign national. So we had one down the segregation unit who'd been problematic on the wings. We're talking Liverpool here. And um, he I, I've already talked about dirty protest. He started a dirty protest. Um, but I think he was quite clever with it because, yeah. So I think he did a dirty protest that I would do. If I was going to do a dirty protest, this is what I would do. So I'm not into smearing shit on my body, not into smearing shit all around. Well, I'm not anyway, but I wouldn't be. So he wasn't into, that sounds really weird, is not it? He wasn't into smearing shit on the walls, wasn't into smearing shit on his body. Fair play to him. Good lad. We don't have to deal with it. But he did, however, sit for three days, three whole days, with a turd on his head. And we checked him all the time. Well, the staff checked him all the time. And a turd on his head. And we just used to laugh. I know it sounds awful. We just used to laugh because we're like, that doesn't prove you mad. That just proves you stupid. You know what I mean, lad? So his next thing to get up our nose. So we used to roll his shit into like little multis. So under the cell doors, it's like a little gap like that. So we always used to pass things like newspapers and if they wanted newspaper, if they wanted toilet roll, you know, it's like a little gap that you can flick things through. Mm. Well, he decided to roll up his poo into like little Maltese type things and flick them out the door. Sometimes you piss out the door. Sometimes there'd be piss and little flicks of like Maltese poo. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. So, but still it wasn't, I'd probably do that. It wasn't as bad as the thingy but he thought that would make him mad and we're just like even the psychiatrist was like you're stupid not mad you know <laughs> and once he found out that he was going back to Iran or whatever and he had absolutely no choice he miraculously recovered the turd came off his head and there were no Maltesers but um yeah they'll try anything was that was that a similar guy that was running around the cell naked or is that oh no that was another guy who'd uh, taken spice and was doing naked cartwheels across the exercise yard with his um package swinging free shall we say <laughs> and people and people say to me and restrain him I'm like no he's like not harming anyone he's not hurting himself he's just getting cut it was cold as well it was night time it was cold we've got him on cctv we can see him we can see what he's doing 
if he wants to fucking dance around naked and cartwheel and do handstands naked, that is his business. When he's calmed down and come off the drug, come down off the drugs, then we'll go in and get him. But uh, yeah, I've seen a few sites. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about joining the prison service? It's really that's a really difficult question. You put me on the spot there. Or would you advise stay away from it? My advice would be to stay away, to be fair, because the prison service has changed so much, so, so much. In the, the 21 years that I did, it's completely unrecognisable now, I would say. However, there are some people that are cut out, I think, to be prison officers. And I think if you go in with humility and resilience, a strong moral compass, a strong belief in right and wrong, but also a belief in that there's always grey areas in life. Um, I think if you're a bit older, you've got a bit of life experience. I think that helps a great deal. Um I know when I went in at 21, I was wholly unprepared. You know, it took all those experiences that I went through to sort of make me into an adult. Um, but yeah, at the moment, I wouldn't recommend it. The wages aren't great. The leave isn't great. I mean, like I said, when I joined, benefits were brilliant. The wages were brilliant. Everything was, the pension was brilliant. It's not the same anymore. And, you know, people the violence levels are going through the roof in the prison service and that's violence on women as well that's violence of men on women which never used to happen um and i just think you can earn double that driving a bus driving a train drive you know a far less stressful job um i was just going to say like lee our friend yeah exactly yeah 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 exactly so you know why would you want to be on a landing getting beaten up, which people are regularly, for a pittance, hardly any time off, stupid, ridiculous shifts where you don't see your families and you work 10 days on, and and then you're absolutely fucked for the four days that you're off. Mm -hmm. It's just not something I'd recommend. I was, You know, and every job is going to have its problem. I'm sure your job has its issues and your job has its frustrations. Mm -hmm. There is no perfect job at all. However, there are jobs that are safer than others. And I would say that the prison service at the moment is an unsafe place to work. 